dear colleagues, I just need someone to hit the button to start for the next round. Um, our first presenter is from India. Is our translator translating me? La première présentation est de lundi. <laughs> First presentation is from India. And the presenter is Mr. Jayakumar Ramachandran. <laughs> And uh, he is in his late 50s. He has founded a theological school. He is heading mission work. And he was so busy, he never got to do his doctorate. But, but now he's getting registered for a doctoral program. And he is part of the study group on freedom of religion, persecution, and mission of the International Association of Mission Studies. And uh, he wants to write his doctorate about aspects of persecution of Christians and whether sometimes Christians produce their own persecution, they trigger it themselves by unwise behavior. And how Christians can conduct their witness in an, a sensitive way in, in a hostile environment where the majority holds another religion. So if you can start the presentation now, it is a PowerPoint with audio. Obrigado. In the mission and participants of international consultation on mission. No, Dear not. colleagues in Kingdom Mission and participants of international consultation on mission and theology in the context of persecution gathered at São Paulo, Brazil, Indeed, I'm so honored to present my paper in this special session before our distinguished guests here. We have gathered here to think on responding to persecution, theological and missiological perspectives. My topic for my paper is uniqueness of persecution of Christians among religious persecution and Indian approach. My paper is primarily divided into six sections and each section is subdivided as well. Introduction to religious persecution and violence, purpose of the paper, religious persecution and violence in India, biblical and theological survey of persecution and violence, case studies on responses to persecution and violence, and finally conclusion. The first uh, section, Introduction to Religious Persecution and Violence. Religious persecution and violence generally points to a specific prejudice or dealing of a person or group based on one of or all religion, race, and gender. Jesus was put to death on a Roman cross for the crime of blasphemy. He was the first martyr of the Christian church, followed by the apostles, and other bands of believers. It was the beginning of persecution in the history of the church. Christian persecution did not cripple the growth of the church in the Roman Empire, even though early faithful believers were cruelly killed. Religious persecution strictly defined is purely faith and practice related. Religion related violent persecution tends to be focused on specific, often remote areas where religious tensions have been inflamed for one reason or another. 
followers of one faith in one city may never experience violence for their faith, while in another location other ad adherents are being beaten and afflicted extremely. Hence a large part of the problem is defining persecution is in arriving at a common misunderstanding as to what it exactly is. Religious persecution and religious violence have many similarities without greatly drifting from each other, yet they are not the same. The second section, purpose of the paper. The year 2017 has been one of the most traumatic for the Christian community in India since the mass targeted violence of the Kandamahal uh, program in 2007. The prevalence of many myths about what persecution is suggests such incidents to be uh, religion-related violence and not persecution of Christians. Global consultation of WEA Mission Commission at Izmir, Turkey in 2014 presented in one of the sessions on eight myths. This paper is intended to study what has been happening among Christians in India. It seeks to answer uh, questions like, is Christian persecution and violence against Christians the same thing? Is Christian persecution a unique one? How Indian Christians should view the violence happening against Christians? How should the church in India respond to the ongoing challenging situation of Christians? These are key subjects dealt with in this paper in order to understand the uniqueness of Christian persecution and to prepare the church at large in India to adequately deal with this challenge. Third section, religious persecution and violence in India. Religious violence in India is not an uncommon phenomenon. Events of religious violence, though, were not significant during the reigns of dynasties in the history past. They became noticeable ever since Indian Sipai Mutiny of 1857. Readers should be able to distinguish religious violence from religious persecution. A paper was presented on this in detail by me at the Consortium of Mission Studies at Union Biblical Seminary, India. Religious violence continues to plague India at present as evidenced by uh, the chart that I have presented in my paper. In general, persecution is perceived as extreme violence, martyrdoms, imprisonments, and torture. This common perception needs to be revisited as no Indian religion has same degree of persecution or violence everywhere in India. Religious persecution and violence against the Hindus. In the 8th century AD, Muhammad bin Qasim mobilized 6,000 cavalries and attacked Indian kingdoms ruled by Hindu and Buddhist kings. Temples were demolished and mass execution of resisting forces were carried out. Muhammad of Ghazni in the 11th century caused destruction of temples too. 13th century Kilji dynasty crushed many with mass executions. 14th century as well had similar violence against Hindus during the reign of the Duklak dynasty. 15th century had witnessed a similar scenario during the dynasties of Sayyid and Lodi. Though the 16th century saw Akbar's tolerant spirit, Jahangir's reign was painful for many Hindus. 17th century Hindus witnessed Aurangzeb's atrocities, which was one of the worst religious violence in the history of the Mughal Empire. 18th century, Tipu Sultan had few on his account. After Indian independence from the British rule in 1947, the Hindu majority made in Hinduism rise as the major religion. In the democratic setup and with Hindu elected representatives, use the legislature and the judiciary as cover to protect Hindus from religious persecution. However, incident of similar magnitude against the Hindus continue to occur. Some recent examples in this millennium are as follows. Nearly 60 were killed in a train in northern part of India on the 27th day of 2002 
on account of Hindu Muslim issues. In response to this brutal act, the riots further intensified and killed more than 1,000 people. 3rd January 2018, India Today magazine counted two killings of Hindu young men. The second subsection. One of the key findings of a Center for Study of Society and Secularism, Minority Rights Group International on Violence Against the Minorities in India, is that in 2016 alone, more than 700 outbreaks of communal violences had taken place, with 86 killed and 2,321 injured, besides numerous unreported incidents. Well-known daily Hindustan Times published that Britain would raise the issue of alleged persecution of Christian Sikhs in India with Prime Minister Narendra Modi during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London in April 2018, which was a past event. This section continued to discuss on religious persecution and violence against the minorities. Religious persecution and violence against the Muslims. Center for Study of Society and Secularism and Minority Rights Group International further adds in their report that religious minorities are especially vulnerable to the threat of communal violence, in particular Muslims, while making up less than 15% of the population, have typically made up the large majority of victims. Religion had significant role to play in 12 of above stated 14 clashes. This paper does not intend to arbitrate just between the parties involved, rather it intends to specify that Muslims were the victims of the violence occurred and religions had a key role in them. The causes for this violence against Muslims are varied. Resentment toward the Islamic uh, domination of India during the Middle Ages, policies established by the country's British colonizers, the violent partition of India into an Islamic Pakistan and a secular India with a Muslim minority and economic competition between Hindus and Muslims are some of the causes. Muhammad Ghori of 20th century did similar attacks against Hindus. A religious persecution and violence against the Sikhs. From the birth of Singh Sabha in 1873 till the rise of Bidran Wale in 1980, Sikhism had various internal conflicts with minimal clashes which were caused by both religious and political issues. Bidran Wale, when committed for revitalizing the spiritual aspects of Sikhism through baptism and Khalsa, a Kalital a religio-political party was greatly challenged. His attack on Nirankaris and, and killings of 12 Sikhs in 1978 made Sikh movement radicalized. In June 1984, late Prime Minister Mrs. Indira Gandhi led the Indian Army fought their way into Golden Temple at Amitsar, where Bidran Wale and his supporters had uh, entrenched. It was known as Operation Blue Star. Indian Army gained control of the situation and Bidran Wale and many other Sikh followers were killed. Same year in October, Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated at the hands of her two Sikh body bodyguards in an act of retaliation for Operation Blue Star. This had resulted in brutal anti-Sikh violence in New Delhi and other parts of the country. Many Sikhs were killed. Religion and politics are combined in Sikhism. Religious persecution and violence against the Buddhists. It is assumed that King uh, Pushya Matra of the second century BC was the first one who had persecuted Buddhists in India. History does not endorse any serious violence or persecution by Hindus against Buddhists. However, Buddhism could not be established in India even though its origins are traced to India. When uh, Iktir Uddin Muhammad bin Bhaktiyar Kilji had invaded Magadha, the Buddhist shrines at Nalanda were destroyed. His successor, Muhammad Khilji, destroyed many Buddhist monasteries and sanctuaries. Muhammad, a Muslim invader and Turkish chieftain, massacred many Buddhists and monks and burnt many shrines, stupas and temples. He viewed Buddhism as a peasant version of Hinduism and either forcibly converted them to Islam and persecuted them to death. Religious persecution and violence against Christians. Approximately 250 million 
Christians now experience high, very high or extreme levels of persecution. This represents one in 12 Christians worldwide. In 2017-18, 3,066 Christians were killed, 1,252 were abducted, 1,020 were raped or sexually harassed, and some 93 churches were attacked. Religious persecution and violence against Christians is increasingly worldwide. Christian persecution and violence against them are more recent developments in the Indian scenario. Christian mission in India during pre-colonial time did not witness severe persecution in its beginning. The spirit of hatred among Hindus toward Christians began to spread during the colonial uh, era. It was not because of the faith and practices of Christians, instead it was their inclination with whites who were the colonial masters. Hindu revivalists had amicable uh, relationship with Christian missionaries such as William Carey. Political commentators have observed that the upswing in violence against Christians has coincided with the ascendancy of Hindu nationalistic movements. By mentioning these comments, the author registered his quest concerning present-day Christian persecution in India, or the faith and practice of Christian, the real cause for violence against Christian being witnessed in India. If that were the case, Christian persecution should have been severe from 17th century itself. On the other hand, most of the Hindus have been expressing an ecumenical spirit in religious matters throughout history. Never have they claimed to be exclusive possessors of truth. It is not necessary to be or become a Hindu to obtain salvation. They recognize revealing and saving powers in all great religions. In general, Hindus respect all prophets and sages who come uh, to guide humanity. An extract is presented here uh, to portray the, the level of government in India used force toward religious groups. And that was done by Pew Research Center, which is uh, presented in my paper. List of 23 brutal incidents had occurred in seven identified provinces, out of which missionaries and Christian believers were arrested. Seven of 20 events had manipulated allegations of unethical conversion. This was the common accusation registered against the victims by aggressive anti-Christian forces. However, no final judicial verdicts are mentioned in the report. Three events were related to non-Christian religious issues. World Watch List declares that India is the top country where very high persecution prevails. It is the 11th in status among the 50 countries where it declares most dangerous to follow Jesus. Among the world's 25 most populous countries, India stands out as having one of the five most religiously restricted countries, having been socially hostile and high range governmental restriction. Following are the observations made from the uh, list of types of violences and places where they had taken place in India, published by Evangelical Fellowship of India. The chart is part of my paper. Highest type of violence in number is physical violence or arrested. Had occurred in 110 places in 18 states, out of which three states had the highest occurrences that are in Chhattisgarh, Uttar Pradesh and Maharashtra. Second highest type is threats that had occurred in 70 places in 16 states, out of which three states had highest occurrences in Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. Third highest type is church worship stopped that had occurred in 64 places in 15 states, out of which three states had the highest occurrences in Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh and Telangana. Fourth highest type is falsely accused and arrested that had occurred in 49 places in 13 states, out of which three states had the highest occurrences in Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. Four highest number of violence occurred provinces of Tamil Nadu which are 52 events, and Uttar Pradesh, 50 events, Chhattisgarh, 43 events, and Maharashtra, 38 events. Highest type of violent activities includes physical violence, extending oral threats, stopping church worships, falsely accused, and police arrest, predominantly in the states of Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra, and Telangana. Highest number of violent activities have taken place in the states of Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh, Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra. All these states where violence against Christians are found 
are either being ruled by Bharatiya Janata Party or by their close allies. These stated facts, figures, and trends of Bharatiya Janata Party undeniably keep perpetuating threats and fears among Christians and Christian leaders. My fourth major section here is Biblical and Theological Survey of Persecution and Violence. Religious persecution and violence are two dissimilar challenges with many similar outward marks that cannot easily be distinguished without a biblical and theological approach. If the church does not carefully understand these two, Christians will certainly fail to find a possible biblical solution to the core. Religious fanaticism is one of the common causes for both atrocious acts apart from their respective combination of significant causes. Outwardly, both led to conflicts in society, but the nature and outcome of the conflicts of each need a detailed study. It is important to consider the exegetical meaning of the word persecution from the New Testament. The Holy Spirit used two key words, diako and tephsis, to distinguish between faith-related persecution and eschatology-related afflictions. There are 43 occasions in which King James Version uses the word diako, which is translated persecution in the New Testament. The context of most of the usage Usages of this word are exclusively related to believers who are experiencing pain due to their faith in the Lord. Persecution is the systematic attempt to suppress or to exterminate Christ Christianity by social pressure to the point of uh, uh, violence. A thipsis is translated as persecution only one occasion, whereas the same word is translated in another 42 occasions as affliction. The usage of this word is mostly in the context of eschatological predictions. Tilsis does not necessarily imply a hostile outcome due to someone's faith in the Lord Jesus as usage is convey. Pre- and post-millennial advocates closely relate Tilsis with their doctrinal position on eschatology. Even our millennialists, though they do not set an eschatological agenda as other schools do, still have room for afflictions in the kingdom as part of eschatological fulfillment. Thus, Thipsis should not be thought to indicate the suffering of the believers of the Lord Jesus due to the word of faith. Mark 4.17 exemplifies the distinction between Thipsis and Diaco. There are two categories Mark speaks about. One category speaks of people who undergo Thipsis and the other of people experiencing diaco. Mark connects diaco with on account of the word to distinguish Christian persecution. The fifth major section I have is uh, case studies on responses to persecution and violences. There are 10 case studies I made in detail and proper analysis is made in my paper. Now I make uh, the last section which is conclusion. The conclusion consists two subsections. One is observations, the other one is uh, uh, suggestions. Observation. In the light of religious persecutions and violence in India, in the past it is observed that, one, religious persecution, religious violence are generally understood to mean the same thing. Two, present persecution violence against Christians are not uncommon. Three, violence against one religion can be caused by several reasons. And five, seldom history in the past had faith-based persecutions. In the light of biblical and theological survey of persecution and violence, it is observed that, number one, Christians should understand the exegetical meaning of the Greek words Thipsis and Diako in order to face the Christian persecution violence wisely. Persecution Diako encompasses a wide spectrum of hostility that may or may not go with violence. Three, and should not be defined on the basis of the extent of harm it might cause or the level of hostility in which it occurs. Four, clipsis in ordinary usage describes actual physical pressure on a man, but in scripture it means tribulation. Five, it's a word closely connected with a eschatological event which would be triggered by unbelievers and Jews against mankind and God's wrath upon God and godly. And sixth one, religious violence in general and against Christians in particular will continue to increase. Persecution against Christians' faith and practice will increase in future. 
In the light of the case studies of Christian responses toward persecution and violence in India, it is observed that, number one, not all Hindus resist against the Christian faith. Two, anger and bitterness are obvious toward churches and mission activities by the Hindu fanatics. Three, the number of anti-Christian hate campaign is on the rise. Four, some Christian and church leaders are reckless in being mindful of the law of the land. Five, Hindu fanatics make use of every lapse that churches and Christian leaders cause as they do their mission. Six, resistance from Hindu fanatics will increase in its degree and level. Seven, all protective measures against persecution and violence carried out by agencies cannot prevent them and not much has been accomplished by them. And eight, true believers are willing to pay the cost for their faith. And from these observations, I make suggestions. Unquestionably, Christian church and faith are under the grip of pressures and challenges. Uh, loud voices of rescue solution being heard by the author from many recognized Christian leadership icons as response such as All India United Christian Front, All India Christian Minority Front, All India Christian Democratic Front, All India Christian Council, National United Christ Front, and alike. My intention is not to criticize any of these people by giving certain suggestions which are falling in line with what these uh, organizations have been predominantly doing. My suggestion number one, church must prepare Christians on how to witness in midst of adverse realities. All of the human, number two, all of the human preventive measures that church and Christians would make need not to be discouraged. However, Christians must be taught that these measures would not solve their issues. Three, Christians must be taught on preventive measures against violence and persecution in their given context. Four, Christians must initiate for harmony among religious communities. Five, Christians must be taught how to hold their exclusive belief in Christ, Jesus, in a pluralistic context and fulfill their mission. Six, church in India should undertake ministering the Christian victims of persecution and violence rather than seeking for help from the West. 7. Mission, church, missionary and mission field ought to be redefined in order to make them workable in Indian context. 8. Evangelism, disciple making and church planting ought to be carried out to produce firm and strong believers who could stand firmly for the truth in midst of the increasing persecution and violence. Thank you very much. Okay, what about an Indian speed train? <laughs> Thank you to the translator. Are you still alive? <laughs> uh, where, where is Felipe? Felipe wanted to do the, the link. Can someone call him? Or, or were you supposed to make the link via Skype? Sure. Then please do that immediately. Uh, my connection is too weak uh, to make the Skype call. Uh, yeah, Jayakuma Ramachandran, and now we'll click on the, click on the, here. yeah, here, yes. Hello, Jayakuma, can you hear us? Huh? Yeah, yeah, I could hear you. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for staying up so late for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So How was it? We have just listened to your presentation. Okay. And the interpreter is still alive, but a little exhausted. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we have mainly... Um, Brazilian students of law here uh -huh. who are interested in religious freedom and of various okay. levels from bachelor, masters, doctoral students and we have Professor Cole Durham, Barry Basset uh, here. So now uh, is the just a, Yes? Uh, your volume is uh, echoing too much. I cannot hear you properly. Um, You don't hear me properly. Um, let me try. If, is there a microphone here? Where, can you hear me better now? 
Yeah, this is for better. You're right. Okay, so now there is the opportunity for the audience to post questions. Yes, please. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, Jaya Kuma, we're waiting for your response. Uh, the current situation, uh, I mean, uh, from a political perspective, uh, uh, right now, in fact, you know, this morning um, there was. Uh, there was a kind of riot in Tamil Nadu in one particular part, and uh, and uh, and uh, the kind of riots that I have given in the paper in the in my paper, uh, it continues still in many places, but uh, not many of them, in my opinion, are based on faith issues. Uh, there are issues. Uh, some of them, they have some ethnic colored issues. Some of them have uh, uh, political reasons. And uh, some of them, they have uh, 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 lingual issues. And just this week, uh, there is a big festival called uh, uh, Ganesha Festival. Uh, you must have seen Elephant God. That elephant guard uh, statue, people would take on procession and then threw it into the waters. So that is uh, uh, whenever that procession had uh, taken place in the past, uh, issues would arise. And this time again, there were few issues. Um, so to your question, my answer is. Uh, the religious violence, uh, I, in my paper, I made it very clear that uh, persecution and religious violence, they are a bit away from each other, uh, though they have similar marks. And so right now, lots of religious viol violence, violence are happening in our country among Christians. That's the way I look at it. Of course, there are a few places I myself had uh, uh, interviewed and found there are few cases, very, very few cases, faith issues, uh, particularly those, those problems are within the families, not like, you know, outsiders, they encroach and, and create some trouble, not in that way, within the family, like, uh, like uh, uh, parents uh, chasing away the son or daughter because of their faith, and uh, there are some other uh, 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 kind of uh, trip between the couples. So these are all some of the some of the faith-based issues. Other than that, most of them are not faith-based, in my opinion. <laughs> no, but India and Brazil are linked in the BRICS <laughs> So you must learn more about India. <laughs> okay. Any, anyone want to ask anything? M maybe, uh, Jaya Kumar, you can, in very few sentences, very briefly tell us something about Hindutva. Ideology, what that means. Hindutva ideology is uh, a concept which uh, insists that uh, India uh, must be ruled by 
uh, Hindu philosophy and uh, Hindu religion must be the sole religion of this country and other religions may exist but you know they should uh, they should be part of uh, that Hindu philosophy uh, in natural Hindu is making Hindu philosophy governing this country that's what it means Exactly. That, that's what they want to bring the whole thing into one container. That container is Hinduism. That's what they want to have. It's apparently, it's a, it's, it's a religious nationalism, I would call. I don't, because nationalism, uh, in the beginning, it was very patriotic kind. Now, again, the nationalism is a patriotic but religious centered right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Now you must rest from a long day of ministry. May God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Christopher, for your patience. And we will communicate again. Thank you. Bye bye. I think the next presentation will have a lower speed, <laughs> which, which is helpful. Um, and so now we will move to North Korea. It's the presentation of Tim Peters. And Tim Peters, I think, lives in South Korea and works to help Christians in North Korea. Reaching in to underground believers, guiding others in flight. Silent partners assist North Koreans under Caesar's sword. Tim A. Peters. You have to click for every slide. Introduction. The government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, DPRK or North Korea, has the dubious distinction of being classified in the Open Doors World Watch List as the worst state sponsor of Christian persecution for 16 consecutive years through 2018. The roots of this toxic strain of religious intolerance can be found in the personality and political philosophy of North Korea's founding father, Kim Il-sung, the current absolute leader's late grandfather. From the very formation of the DPRK 70 years ago in 1948 under the leadership of Kim Il-sung, people of faith were viewed with great distrust and suspicion. King Kim's repressive measures were not part of some hidden agenda of the state or its workers' party. Absolute and relentless indoctrination to dissuade religious believers from their faith was the opening and initial phase ordered by Supreme Leader Kim. Secondly, religious leaders who were found to be engaged in quote-unquote counter-revolutionary or anti-state activities had to be punished in accordance to related laws an ominous category of, quote, targets of the dictatorship, end quote, was designated for those clergy who stiffened their backs against reform by the Workers' Party. Kim Il-sung lost no time in punishing clergy in labor and re-education camps, uprooting Christians from their residences, killing others, and forcing some into relocation of dif to different regions of the country especially the province that was nicknamed DPRK's Siberia, North Hamgyong province. Such harsh measures continue to be used to this day as a vital tool to eradicate any loyalties that veer away from the 
Kim family regime. As the subsequent examples painfully illustrate, state-sponsored repression of Christianity and the brutal persecution of its adherents have not changed despite the passage of 56 years since Kim Il-sung's blunt pronouncement quoted above. A special 2014 United Nations Commission of Inquiry report on human rights in the DPRK, known as the COI for short, found that, quote, religious believers in North Korea who practice outside the small number of state-controlled religious institutions are considered to introduce politically or ideologically subversive influences and are subject to crimes against humanity, end quote by the DPRK government. During these painful decades, the rock-hard reality of being under the sword of Caesar has resulted in a number of responses by believers. In large part, sincere Christians have sought survival by going underground and keeping their faith in secret. It should come as no surprise that the remnant of the North Korean historical church, which dates from the great revival of Pyongyang in 1907, operates with almost world-class security protocols as a category. <laughs> off the radar that many trained outside observers, both secular and ecclesiastical, do not even believe that it exists. So severe, for example, have been the penalties of the state for the discovery of the evangelization of children that many North Korean Christian parents have made the agonizing decision to refrain from revealing their faith even to their own children. They do so to prevent the catastrophic consequences of an entire family being sent to a labor camp if authorities learn that the Christian faith has been transmitted between generations. Despite such extreme caution, at present the North Korean gulag prison system is a cheerless abode to multitudes of entire extended families who've been banished for holding firm to their Christian faith. In the absence of authentic and healthy above-ground church institutions inside the DPRK, external Christian activists, out of necessity, have devised strategies to assist their North Korean brethren, some examples of which will be described in this paper. With the majority of believers living at a subsistence level, humanitarian aid to the church takes on vital importance. Especially in the past 25 years, hundreds of thousands of North Koreans have fled their homeland, some to escape hunger, others to find freedom, including religious freedom, beyond their nation's borders. This bravery has often been rewarded by unplanned contact with sympathetic Chinese, South Korean, and other non-Asian foreign Christians in China and other neighboring countries. Here we find creative, nearly invisible partnerships that assist North Korean escapees in the untracked vast land of China, the government of which systematically repatriates North Korean refugees to certain harsh punishment, if not worse, in the DPRK. In much the same way that external organizations and individuals of conscience quietly find ways to assist the North Korean underground believers in their country, so do others help those traveling on the so-called Underground Railroad of East Asia. This network of volunteers is reminiscent of the network of abolitionists, largely Christian, who assisted African-American slaves from southern slave states to free ones in the North before and during the U.S. Civil War in the mid-19th century. Since open Christian partnerships with non-Koreans inside the DPRK are virtually impossible, this paper, set in an historical context, 
will explore the intensely challenging fieldwork of assisting North Korean Christians in crisis, both in North Korea and China. Section Heading Underground believers endure harsh internal conditions, yet are strengthened by the response of external assistance. Number one. Brutal detention and prison treatment are based on inmates' Christian faith. North Korea's Kyohwaso, ordinary prison camp number 12 at Chonggori, is noteworthy because it houses a relatively high number of inmates imprisoned directly due to their Christian faith. A handful of former inmates of prison number 12 have managed to survive their ordeals and escape the DPRK. One such former prisoner, Che Yong Sheik, was specifically charged with the quote-unquote crime of being a Christian in North Korea. Mr. Che's testimony is as follows. One day in August of 1998, about 40 prisoners of a farm work unit were on their way to the fields at dawn. It was still quite dark. The weary workers came across a strange bag lying in the middle of the road. Opening the large bag, they found a human corpse wearing a red shirt. The prisoners immediately identified the deceased as Kim Ju Won, the Christian prisoner, who had been given a red shirt by his sister during a recent family visit to the prison. The prisoners remembered that Kim had recently been called out at night, some days previously, by the guards ostensibly for reassignment to another prison. A number of executed prisoners' bodies had been carried away at night for burial upon the more remote hilly area of the prison camp. One of the primitive body bags had apparently tumbled unseen from a truck or a cart carrying victims of secret execution to the disposal area for prisoners' corpses. The discovery of the strangled body of their fellow prisoner and persecuted Christian Kim Ju Won in the distinctive red shirt was soon whispered from prisoner to prisoner, thereby quickly exposing the prison's secret execution, making them common knowledge among a wide circle of inmates. A female former inmate of Kyowaso No. 1 prison at Kechon provided her testimony at a UN Commission of Inquiry hearing and explained that she was, quote, sent to prison for expressing her Christian religion and was punished ten times with solitary confinement during her seven years of detention. She was also assigned to pull the cart used to remove human excrement from the prison latrines. Several times the guards made her lick off the excrement that had spilled over the edge of the cart in order to humi humiliate and discipline her. Intervention number one by external partners with North Korean believers in flight. Strategic NGO logistical support in cooperation with fellow Christian activists, has enabled a number of former prisoners of Chonggori and other prisons in North Korea to make their way to freedom and share with the world and the United Nations the ordeals of Christian persecution before and during their North Korean detention. Number two, food security minimized or denied Christians due to their perceived disloyalty. DPRK society has since 1970 been divided up by government assignment into 51 categories or songbun of perceived loyalty to the supreme leader Kim's family. However, these 51 classifications really boil down to basically three designations of citizen reliability. One, loyal, two, wavering, three, hostile. Protestants were given a status of number 36 from the top, and Catholics were designated as category number 39. 
both Christian groups clearly falling into the rock bottom tier of the citizenry, deemed as hostile and untrustworthy by the ruling elite. It must be emphasized that such a social class designation is not simply a badge one wears on the lapel of his or her jacket. Songbun determines, among other privileges, access to food and residence. Su Lao Tse, in her landmark surveys over 20 years ago, had already made the following observations about distribution of food in the DPRK when scarcities have arisen. Quote, there are reports that the DPRK government has stopped providing food through the public distribution system to marginalized regions, those areas without economic resources or political capital, seem to have been left to fend for themselves. End of quote. Lao Tse goes on to observe, quote, the DPRK's insistence on maintaining a full army and providing for the population of Pyongyang and other important areas is at the expense of those who are suffering. This analysis is consistent with the testimonies of thousands of North Korean refugees who have left their homeland. It should not be overlooked that the pre-existing bias of food security towards the higher Songbun citizens becomes exacerbated when adverse weather conditions reduce the DPRK's national harvest. A World Food Program representative on September 13, 2018, presented in Seoul, Korea, high-resolution satellite imagery of DPRK agricultural regions, highlighting the severe damage done to crops by heat stress, droughts, and flash floods in recent months of the current year. This official lamented the above-mentioned conditions that have markedly worsened the harvest forecast for 2018. The World Food Program's current grim assessment is that 10.3 million DPRK citizens, or fully 40% of the entire nation, is currently malnourished it must be observed that visitors to Pyongyang, the capital, however, report no such shortages. Intervention number two by external partners with North Korean believers. A number of Christian missions and NGOs have undertaken official and unofficial food aid to the vulnerable sectors of the DPRK population since the extreme famine of the mid-1990s. Some organizations have continued to experiment with a variety of food aid strategies over the past 25 years, ranging from rice, rice crackers, rice cakes, corn, cornbread, various types of bread, and a wide variety of vegetable seeds, just to name a few. A number of organizations provide food aid exclusively to Christians but others take a wider view and assist any seriously vulnerable sector of the population to which they're able to gain reasonable access. Certainly, an authentic and reliable human network to transfer food aid directly to the secret church inside the North remains one important component of some external partners' assistance efforts. Avoiding the transport of food aid through DPRK government channels and mechanisms prevents the regime's distribution patterns that favor the privileged Songbun classes. Instead, the use of couriers, a combination of foreign Christians outside North Korea's borders, and local believers within the DPRK has provided a more reliable and secure distribution of food assistance guaranteeing that a higher percentage of the food aid actually goes to the truly needy. Number three, health care, like food, is strictly tied to a citizen Songbun classification. Hence, 
Christians are often unable to access proper medical treatment. A consistent theme in multitudes of refugee testimonies is the broken medical system in the DPRK. Although guaranteed universal free health care in the regime's founding principles and propaganda, the simple reality is that medical facilities are skewed heavily to the privileged based on their social classification. A common joke among fleeing North Korean refugees is that North Korean clinics and hospitals and medical staff can diagnose your problem, but treatment is forthcoming only if you have found a way to prepare a bribe to pay inflated under the table health care prices. Because health is so closely tied to nutrition, it is little wonder that the immune systems of a great number of people in the lower Songbun classes are greatly weakened and vulnerable to any number of illnesses and maladies. Intervention number three by external partners with North Korean believers. The DPRK has tended to be more tolerant of foreign Christian healthcare organizations being resident within its borders than other types of humanitarian aid based on religious motivations. However, due to recent increased tensions under Kim Jong-un related to the DPRK's nuclear and ballistic missile programs, some of these organizations have either been forced to leave or have left voluntarily. Consequently, medical assistance that is being provided cross-border by informal means has taken on greater significance in recent years. Medicines to treat commonly occurring illnesses such as dysentery, tuberculosis, scarlet fever, typhoid, paratyphoid, typhus fever, influenza, and other communicable diseases have provided the underground Christian community with urgent medical assistance. Antibiotics, treatments for the common cold, diarrhea, and age-related problems such as arthritis and rheumatism have been received with great appreciation by the hidden church, especially the elderly. In the past 20 years, many North Koreans have fled their country to China with grave medical emergencies for which they could not get treatment at home. Christian activists have helped to evacuate them along the Underground Railroad to South Korea, where good medical treatment is plentiful under favorable government policies. The two females in this picture who are shown uh, in a South Korean hospital are cases in point. On the left, Ms. Shin endured a colostomy in North Korea without anesthesia. Uh, not being successful there, Ms. Shin came out to China in desperate hope to find some further treatment. Christian activists along the Underground Railroad helped her to eventually make her way to South Korea. Sadly, South Korean doctors informed her that her colon cancer was too advanced to be stopped. Uh, Ms. Sheen devoted her remaining months to sharing her new faith. On the right side uh, is Ms. Kim, who in China, while she was detained by the Chinese authorities in a Chinese jail, uh, attempted to commit suicide by slitting her own wrist. Uh, it will be evident by the bandage on her wrist uh, shown in the picture. Fortunately, she was unsuccessful in that attempt and uh, was able to be freed in China without being sent back to North Korea. Uh, the Underground Railroad assisted her to South Korea, where she has started a new life. In conclusion, this presentation has highlighted a number of distinct responses by North Korean believers to state-sponsored persecution under its government's extreme form of militaristic and race-based nationalism, guided by a brutal and atheistic hereditary leadership. One course of action for believers has been to go underground for survival, with full understanding that such an option could result in imprisonment for the entire family. 
An equally daunting choice for the believer has been to flee as a refugee from repressive DPRK policies that target believers. Implicit in this course of action is the calculated risk of possible detection by Chinese authorities followed by the dangers of repatriation or the manipulation, especially of women refugees, by ruthless human traffickers in China. In a parallel manner, the manuscript has illustrated a number of concrete examples of assistance strategies devised by external Christian partners to assist both types of beleaguered North Korean believers described above. Providing Christian assistance to North Koreans inside their nation has proven a most daunting challenge to traditional mission strategies. With a very few notable clandestine exceptions, setting up an open residential mission within North Korean borders is out of the question. Missionaries are officially vilified and foreign visitors are virtually suffocated with surveillance by minders whenever they set foot on North Korean soil. The logical alternative for many has been to set up a base in nearby China. Increasingly though, this is no easy task. Not only has its government shown itself consistently hostile to North Korean refugees found on its territory, China has also been anything but hospitable to the idea of being used as a staging area for foreign Christian activists who wish to focus on the desperate humanitarian and spiritual needs of 23 million DPRK citizens, including the church. With each passing year, the Chinese government has made a concerted effort to comb out from the border area these very Christian helpers who have lent such meaningful assistance to North Koreans on the run. Nevertheless, in this difficult border region, as with determined believers inside the North, brave, ordinary followers of the King of Kings find new and unexpected open doors and creative responses to deal with increasingly constrained conditions. Their actions are a constant reminder that, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Thank you for your kind attention to this presentation. Thank you. Um, the person who tried to call us is the presenter of the next paper. The presenter of this paper is sleeping now because it is 13 hours ahead of Brazil. Um, but if you want to ask any questions or have any knowledge about North Korea, you're welcome to speak. I also know a little bit, so we can take five minutes. Anyone? Was this new information to you? Was this information new for you? Some, some? Yes, you can ask me the question. I can try to answer. A launching ground. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that, that increasing is influenced by North Korea? Um, no. The, China is a huge country with a huge population. 
And the main concern of the communist government is control. And any entity that gets too large or is too difficult to control is then squashed. Um, so for example, the Uyghur Muslims, a Muslim people group with the name Uyghur. Yeah, Uyghur. Uh, there are large concentration camps for them. They're treated as terrorists. Then there are marginal Christian groups, which we would not consider Christians, but they call themselves Church of the Almighty God. And they are the most strongly persecuted group in China right now. And they flee to Europe. They call themselves Church. Church of the and they are the most strongly persecuted in China currently. Before, the most strongly persecuted group were Falun Gong. They had some physical exercise and some Eastern philosophy, and many of them were put in camps, and their adherents claim that in the camps, body parts were taken from them to sell on the, on the transplantation market. And concerning Christians, in, in the past year, there were three areas of pressure. Uh, the first one was against uh, children, Ch that uh, provinces said children may not attend church, but the parents do it anyway. The second level had to do with the Bible. Um, there had been regulations all along on the distribution of the Bible. And there was only permission to spread printed Bibles through the registered churches and to the registered members of the registered churches. But the Bible had also been sold via online channels. And that could happen because existing laws were not implemented. And now the laws were implemented and the, sale, the online sale of Bibles was closed down. And the, the third level is the arrest of human rights defenders. So lawyers, attorneys who stand up for human rights, many of them Christians, many of them defending Christians, some of them writing reports about the overall human rights situation in the country. And from one day to another they vanish in a prison. Oh or we don't know where. So more than 200 of them have been arrested. And one of them who was still at the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington early this year, died in a hospital under very mysterious circumstances a few months later. Now, now about China and North Korea. China is holding its hand over North Korea. The, the system in North Korea could not continue without Chinese protection. Oh, the reason is China is afraid that North Korea will crumble and they will have a huge wave of refugees going into China.
So anyone who flees North Korea into China and is caught by the Chinese is immediately repatriated to North Korea against conventions that China has, chi has signed. China also permits North Korean secret agents to operate in its border territory, on China's territory, to actively seek out refugees, to actively seek out Christians who help North Korean refugees. Chinese Christians, Korean Christians from, no, from the United States, and Korean secret agents also have killed a Christian pastor, ethnically Korean, living in China, ministering to a church there because he has been helping North Korean refugees. We know it is the secret service because they have a certain way of butchering people and leaving their marks. So China has its own problems with a huge population in its own country. And the number of Christians worshipping on a Sunday in China is larger than the number of Christians worship in Europe. And probably the number of Christians in China is larger than the number of members of the Communist Party. N no wonder they get troubled that they're losing control. Now, with the nuclear uh, uh, issues with North Korea, the, the big danger is that with this debate, that human rights and religious freedom issues fall off the table. like when a nuclear deal was done with Iran. Oh yes, now the threat is finished for the world, but they neglected the human rights issues. And nothing has improved in Iran concerning persecution. And the population is still running away. Okay, sorry for being so long. But maybe that gives a bit of the, the bigger picture. Um, the, the author offered, if anyone wants to have his longer paper in writing, I'm allowed to pass it on to you. You just come here and write down your email address on this paper, then you can get it. Also, there is another group I visited in Seoul in South Korea. They're called Voice of the Martyrs Korea. These are the people who navigate balloons over North Korea to drop Bibles at the boundaries of cities. With, with computer-based meteorolo meteorological uh, predictions and GPS systems, They're able to make on-the-spot deliveries. They train believers who have fled from North Korea or who have become Christians after fleeing. To empower them and to make them so courageous that they voluntarily go to China, to the border area of North Korea, to witness to other North Koreans.
And this empowerment is so important if you know that the highest suicide rate in the world is among North Korean refugees in South Korea. Extremely high. Because they don't cope with the culture shock and, and the materialistic society very often. And so empowering them is a very important response in helping people who have escaped persecution. I, I have to stop here because I'm getting all excited. <laughs> All right, um, so now we could have the last presentation. And this is by Richard Hart. He is an American. He has lived in the Middle East for many decades and was involved in theological education by extension in the Middle East. So as a Christian working in that area with the church, he has observed many things over time, how people come to faith in Christ and face persecution and all sorts of other cases. And his spiritual wisdom is the Holy Spirit is our advocate and he guides us how to do advocacy so let's listen to Richard Hart and then we will call him when the presentation is finished obrigado And this one you have to click every time on the loudspeaker. So it plays yeah. in the center. Okay. okay, click and then it will play. Finding and fulfilling advocacy pieces. The lifelong adventure. A personal reflection. An essay by Reverend Richard Hart, PhD. Obedient Christ followers sometimes face seemingly insurmountable obstacles. When they cry out for mercy, God hears. God the Holy Spirit, who is also known as the Advocate, guides Christ followers to create pieces of personal advocacy that help other believers. Watchful Christ followers discover their pieces of advocacy God fits these small pieces of advocacy into life streams to fulfill his will. We see this happening as we reflect on 1 Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you will stand up under it. Our loving God always cares and shares his love for us. He often shows his love through encouraging us and others to create pieces of advocacy. Okay, click. Advocacy in this paper will introduce its source, describe the scope of activities, and present a synthesis of several real-life pieces of advocacy. Cases synthesized in this essay Consider people being persecuted for their faith commitments and people feeling like they're being persecuted because of consequences beyond their control. Okay. 
the Advocate, God, the Holy Spirit. When we look for the word Advocate in the Bible, we find that it is used several times as another name for God, the Holy Spirit. Jesus used this term. And I will ask <clears throat> the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. John 14, 16. The advocate, God, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus spoke these words, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, John 14, 16. When Jesus spoke these words, he knew that the Holy Spirit as the helper that God the Father would give to Christ's followers in the days to come. The Lord Jesus had been a face-to-face -face and arm-in-arm -arm helper for the disciples. God the Holy Spirit would make himself known to the believers and be a real-time helper. The Holy Spirit would reveal himself as the spirit-to-spirit -spirit and heart-to-heart -heart helper and guide. When Jesus said these words to his disciples, they did not know what he meant. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. John 14, 26. The disciples knew the meaning of the word advocate. It was the term for someone in a court scene that helps a person face his judges. Jesus uses the word to describe the Holy Spirit's future, ever-present help. He would become their, quote, refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble, end quote. Psalm 46, 1. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. John 15, 26, the words of Jesus. As Jesus revealed the person and presence of God the Father, the Holy Spirit would testify to the mission of Jesus. That mission was to accomplish God the Father's will. The Holy Spirit would make the will of God known to his disciples. It was not that they would know Jesus less. Although they could not see God the Son incarnate, they would know him more and more through God the Holy Spirit, who would live in and with them. They did not understand this then, as we do now. They would not be able to grasp the meaning until he was glorified by God the Father through the cross and resurrection. Perhaps during those transition days between the resurrection to the ascension that Jesus helped prepare them for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, John 16, 7. We know that the Holy Spirit was given to the believers at Pentecost. His presence within the believers became manifest to all in a spectacular way when everyone who was gathered at the temple in Jerusalem heard the message of the gospel in their own languages from people who previously were not speakers of those languages, Acts 2, 5 to 12. Throughout the Acts of the Apostles, we learn of special acts of mercy that God did through the believers, Acts 3, 1 to 10, Acts 5, 12 to 16, Acts 8, 26 to 40, Acts 12, 1 to 24, Acts 20, 7 to 12, Acts 27, 21 to 28. These were manifestations of the Holy Spirit who lived inside them. With the perspective we have gained since Pentecost and church history, 
we understand deeply the implications of these words of Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God was going to come to indwell believers in Jesus and be a constant witness to their minds, spirits, souls, bodies, and wills. We live in the Lord Jesus and he in us. 1 John 4, 21 to 24. The Holy Spirit continues to testify to our spirits that miracle of miracles, we are Christ's and he is ours. Jesus' promise of the Holy Spirit is now experienced by those who love the Lord Jesus and love to be called by his name. Our souls, spirits, wills, and bodies share in ongoing conversations with the Holy Spirit as he reveals to us the, quote, mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, end quotes, Colossians 1, 26 and 27. It is no wonder, therefore, that we seek to provide advocacy to others because our lives are continually benefiting from the advocate, God the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, we breathe in and breathe out the tendency to be advocates, helpers, counselors, intercessors. Advocacy, desire by design. Advocacy is part of what it means to be created in God's image. We naturally see opportunities to help, and if able, we extend help to others. Culture of Advocacy. God the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, creates for us a culture of advocacy. He plants in our hearts concern for others. He helps our minds think through plans of action. He always draws us to advocate in behalf of Christ's disciples needing help. The Holy Spirit invites disciples seeking mercy to receive these advocacy pieces. As human advocates, we recognize that the advocacy is God-directed, and so through prayer, we seek to keep our conversation with God active. As a community educator, I often find opportunities to provide pieces of advocacy. Being aware of the need for advocacy promotes my dialogue with the Holy Spirit, which helps me remain alert to potential opportunities for advocacy service. Scope of advocacy. When we consider involving ourselves in a piece of advocacy, it is wise to consider steps that will be needed before we decide to become involved, what involvement may mean, and ways to exit the advocacy at closure. Scope of advocacy. A template for planning pieces of advocacy is introduced in this essay. Six sequential steps with two or three activities in each step are suggested. Cases presented. In this essay, there are three cases that will be presented. The first one, Christ followers in extended crisis. 
The second one, vacation travelers becoming asylum applicants. And the third, overseas workers and their employers. Christ followers in extended crisis. My approach is going to be to do a case reading and then to read small pieces of advocacy regarding that case. You will notice that there are two additional cases that are listed. I am not going to read those because there's not enough time during this uh, presentation. But the full paper is with you, and should you be interested, you may wish to read the other two cases and the small pieces of advocacy that go along with them. Now let us begin with case one. Samir and Selwa became Christ followers after they had been married several years. Samir was about 40, and Selwa was in her late 20s when Christ became known to them. Both were from strongly religious Muslim families. They regularly prayed the Islamic ways. After several years of marriage, they were childless. With the help of a hospital team, they attempted in vitro fertilization, IVF, several times at great cost and no success. Being childless in their culture caused family members to think that perhaps they should divorce, but they would not. While traveling to a nearby country, a Muslim friend suggested they go to a church and ask a priest to pray for them and their desire to conceive. They followed their friend's idea. The priest asked the Lord Jesus to give the couple the child they longed for. Within a year, Selwa gave birth to their first baby boy and two years later to a second boy. When the first child was born, they concluded that Jesus had answered their prayer. They thought of their son as a Jesus baby. Out of gratitude, they began hunting for Jesus. They learned from satellite TV that one could buy books about Jesus in their country. Samir searched and found someone who would sell him an Arabic Bible. The same person invited Samir to study the Bible with him and learn about Jesus. Several weeks later, Samir and Selwa began reading the Bible with the bookseller and his wife. As they learned about Jesus from the Bible, Samir and Selwa believed Jesus to be the Savior for all and became his followers. Samir, Selwa, and their children began meeting with other believers in a local church. After several months, Samir and Selwa's families learned they had become Christ followers. This turning from their former religion angered both families. The father pressed his sons to swear that they would shoot Samir in the legs if he did not reject the Jesus path. Samir was given an ultimatum to leave the country and never return. He was given a time limit and travel funds. Samir and Selwa told the church about their situation and asked for help. The leadership received their request and began their prayer and research. Church members began looking for countries the family could travel to and live. Visas would be needed. Only two local embassies gave visas to people being persecuted for religious reasons and whose lives were endangered. Church leaders made appointments with the consular offices. An official of one embassy informed the church leaders that their procedures had changed and that it was no longer possible to apply for asylum through them. 
The other embassy received the asylum request and began sev the pro several month process. Samir told his family about the visa application and that it would take time. The parent agreed to allow his son to stay in the country without harmful consequences until the visa was given. Months later, it became clear that no visa would be awarded. Another alternative was needed. A visitor from another country heard about the case and offered to host the family in his nation. Soon arrangements were made and Samir, Selwa, and their children traveled to that man's community. There they made applications with the United Nations as religious refugees. Some years later, they received refugee status and immigrated to a Western nation where they now live. Advocacy was needed to solve this problem. The challenge was how to find a way of escape from the homeland that would lead to a permanent solution. Their case is explained now using this chart called Small Pieces of Advocacy. Situation encountered, help sought by person in crisis. Samir and Selwa tell the local church leaders about their need. Need explained by person in crisis or third party. Samir and Selwa explain the ultimatum to church leaders. Foreseeables imagined. Room, board, jobs, expenses that would need be needed. Situation pondered, prayer, reflection, and feedback. A decision to engage or not to engage. With concern for parents and children, the church decides to help. Peace to proceed, peace of mind, body, soul, spirit, and will. The leaders were confident that some solution could be found. The whole church was asked to pray that God would open a way. Situation engaged. Meeting the advocatee and third party. Samir and Selwar were interviewed again by the leadership. Deep listening, conversation, note-taking, clarifications. With many listening, taking notes, mentally and in writing, a full picture was gained. Questions back and forth clarified matters. Summarizing the situation. A summary of the situation was gained that the church and the couple understood to be the details of the case. Departure from Jordan along with continuing discipleship was needed. Action planning, writing, staging, evaluating. Beginning and ending steps described. Plans were made for visiting two embassies. Hopefully the parent would relax the ultimatum in order to await the granting of visas. Time estimate and who will work the plan. Visits to the embassies could happen quickly. Asylum requests would take time, perhaps three months. The couple needed help. Implementation, new information, past, present, future advocacy links. On the first embassy visit, it was learned that they no longer did asylum views, visas from their embassy. At the second embassy, New information made the success of the application doubtful. After a year, it seemed that a visa would not be issued. <coughs> Concluding thoughts. Finding pieces of advocacy in new places is part of the adventure of discovering what it means to be created in the image of God. All right, now, now you read it. All right, uh, while he tries to establish the connection to the author, uh, Rick Hart. Yeah, Rick Hart.
Uh, actually, it was in preparing the paper that I. Uh, sorry, uh, some um, distance to the microphone, uh, the sound is very difficult. Okay. Uh, let, let me. Uh, I just changed the. Uh, hold on just a second. I'm, I'm here. Let me answer in a minute. Is this better? All right. I um, when I when I did this paper, the Lord seemed to be saying when I got your letter, and you said, uh, "Can you submit an abstract?" Uh, the Holy Spirit gave me an idea about advocacy, and I uh, I worked on it and sent it to you. As soon as you said yes. Uh, I began studying the passages that I've already been studying from the Gospel of John. And it became abundantly clear that the name for the Lord Jesus, the name for the Holy Spirit is the Advocate. And that enabled me then to debrief my own experience and look back and see that the Lord has given me many opportunities to be an advocate. And as uh, so I wrote it out. You probably have caught on to the fact that all three of those examples are, are examples in which I participated. I, I made a list of about 15 advocacies I'd been involved in in the past. And, but I realized they're just very small pieces. A huge part of people's lives, a small piece in people's lives. And I think that, well, anyhow, it was from writing the paper, brother, that I seemed to understand much more clearly that what I had been doing, I had always been doing because of the Holy Spirit's leading, even though I didn't know it, but I don't now.
All right, now um, we have a mainly a Brazilian audience here, students of law from bachelor's, master's, doctor level, and there's one who would like to ask you a question. Okay, let me say one more thing. Yeah, okay. uh, I, am, I am humbled to have the opportunity to say anything to people of that quality. Thank you. Hello, Ricard. It's Igor. Hello, sir. First of all, I would like to thank you for the presentation. I am preparing myself to be a missionary among the Muslims to go to the mid Middle East. And that presentation has encouraged myself so much. Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to ask you about how do you encourage the people to be part of the great mission? Thank you. Okay, Christoph, can you repeat the question again, please? Yes, the, the question was, how do you encourage people to become part of fulfilling the great commission? I, I would simply say, allow the Holy Spirit to uh, speak to you, and then to uh, be faithful, to obey each thought that he sends your way, recognizing that you can never be absolutely sure. Uh, that's why we have faith. We, we, we believe it, and we step forward, and, and God, uh, God blesses on step number two. He leads on step number one. He blesses on step number two, and then that gives us the faith for step number three. I would say that is how people get excited about it. It's not a formula. It's, it's, it's a faith action. Thank you, Dick. I'm just giving a last call. Anyone wants to ask a question before we close? Raise your hand, now or never. <laughs> All right. So I think people are exhausted now. We have heard seven papers this afternoon. Uh, this morning oh, we, we had uh, a New Testament presentation from First Peter by a senior professor here. Uh, and then we had other uh, interventions, uh, again, uh, more from a philosophical and legal level. So... We are closing tonight with two more sessions. One, and both are theological tonight. One is from an Old Testament professor here from uh, uh, Mackenzie Presbyterian University. And the second presentation will be by my, from myself, and that will be a systematic theological interpretation framework on how to have a Christian view on, on persecution. So, Dick, we thank you very much, also not only for sending your very inspiring paper, but also for making yourself available to answer questions. We are most grateful, and we have heard you offer that anyone who would like to have your full paper may have it. So, we thank you, yes. and may the Lord bless you. May I say one more thing? Please do. Uh, this morning, uh, in our prayer meeting, we were praying for your conference. Um, I pray with a group of uh, people of color, we call it, African American people. We're praying for you and praying that your conference would be a success. We, we recognize how important it is and how influential your seminary students will be in the future. 
And we were praying that God would give you uh, great success. Uh, so now I will tell my colleagues that God seems to be uh, helping all of you to learn what you need. One last thing. A Jordanian person said to me once, he said, Dick, you still have a tender heart. And I want to say to your, your, your scholars, please allow God to continue to give you a tender heart for him and towards the people around you. And if that happens, you will find that your lives will be long-term blessing. When you do the scholarship and the books, it's good, but make sure you keep a tender heart. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Christoph. Okay. Baraka and shukran habibi. Rabbi <laughs> Baraka. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. All right. Now we have basically concluded on time. This is German precision. <laughs> Almost like Swiss clockwork. Okay, now we have a proper time for dinner and the program resumes at 7.30 if I read the program properly and we will have two key presentations and then the concluding remarks and I very much hope to see you all awake again uh, at 7.30. Thank you. Thank you.